So this morning I'm preaching about a name, name called Sue. In a way, that's, my, that's the title of my sermon this morning because we're talking about Jabez and what his name meant. And so uh, uh, Shakespeare says, what's in a name? That which is called a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I'm Tammy. I can be called Tamra, which was my birth name, but I'm still me. I'm still who I am. I could be called Pastor Tammy, but I'm still who I am. I'm called Joe's wife sometimes, but I still have my own identity. I am called my children's mother and my grandchildren's grandmother, but I am still who I am. Now, unfortunately, in this song, Sue took it a little far. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things he could have done. He could have changed his name, gone by his middle name. Some of us do that. He could have done a lot of things, but instead he wore that name. He allowed the name Sue to define his whole life. And so, you know, that's, all that is is a label. You know, maybe as you were growing up, you had parents that told you you were worthless. That happens. You were stupid. Or maybe you labeled yourself because you couldn't get good grades, as you'll never get good grades, you'll never amount to anything. We take on labels in life. We allow people to give us labels. There's many stereotypes. When I was looking this up, what was interesting was Will Smith said that he would not take the movie, I mean, take on the movie The Matrix because he didn't want to know, be known as the alien man. And I thought, well, how does that work out with Men in Black? And so maybe that was after he had filmed Men in Black and he said, no more, no more. I'm not going to be known as the alien man. So he recognized that this could define him and he didn't want to take that title on. Even though Matrix went on to become one of the greatest, great movies. And so many things in life. We stereotype culture. Are you a conservative Christian? Are you a liberal Christian? Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? What are you? We stereotype. Well, if you're a liberal, then er if you're a Democrat, then every Democrat's liberal. That's what we do in life. We take things and stereotype. Now, my husband and I have kind of this joke that whenever we see a Prius, our joke is that whoever drives a Prius is a Democrat. Whether that's true or not, we stereotyped Prius as being a Democrat's car. So we do that in life. We put labels on everything that we have in life. And labels are put on us. Maybe at work, somebody is, somebody is the, the nemesis at, at your work. And you take on the burden of that label that they're trying to put on you to be the torment of your life. So there's so many things in life that allow us to be labeled. How about race? We all know race is a big label nowadays. We think if you are of a certain race, then you're just like the bad person of the race. So for instance, if you're white, then all whites are prejudiced. Wow. <laughs> Woo, I said something there. <laughs> that's speaking to somebody out there. And that's not true. I have never considered myself to be a prejudiced person. Try my best never to be that way. But we can label people to be of a certain culture and take on that label and allow that label to define who we are and what we are in life to define whether we get that good job or we go for that promotion or we become something that God wants us to do and God wants us to be. Maybe we take on the victim mentality. I'll never get that job. I know I'm not good enough. Maybe we look in the mirror and we pick everything apart that's on our face, our bodies, we're not Barbie dolls. Do you ever remember where the big thing went through that Barbie dolls, we needed to get rid of Barbie dolls because it was giving girls inferior, inferiority complexes because they didn't look like a Barbie doll. We allowed society to put on us a label that says, this is how you should look. This is who you need to be. 
So this morning, we're going to learn about a man who did not allow a label to take on his life. Jabez, in Chronicles, what's interesting in Chronicles is the first nine chapters is so-and-so had such-and-such, and such-and-such such then married so-and-so, who then had so-and-so, that then they had so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and that so-and-so had so-and-so. And it goes on like this for a hundred, hundreds of names and family tree. It's the great family tree of the Bible. But in the middle of all this, the Bible stops and says, and there was a man named Jabez, and he was more respected than his brothers. Now, we don't know why Jabez was called pain, which that's what Jabez means. It means pain. We don't know why his mother named him that, other than that she said, his birth caused me much pain. But we don't know why. Maybe something happened to her. He was conceived in a way that, that brought pain upon her. Or maybe she had pain in labor. Or maybe she wasn't ready for that child and knew that he'd be a pain all her life. We don't know why. We just know that she labeled him pain. And this was going to be a name that was going to go throughout life with him. Can you imagine what his brothers did to him? Come on. We all tease our brothers and sisters. Is that not correct? We all like to harass our brothers and sisters. Man, my brother, he, my brother, what he used to like to do was he would take my sister's doll, throw it in the air, and then slug it. Oh, she was traumatized over that. And I have to admit, my brother and I traumatized my sister quite a bit because she was a lot younger than we were. And that's probably what happened to Jabez. Has anybody here seen The Chosen, the movie The Chosen? Raise your hand if you've seen it. I'd like to see how many people have watched it. This is the most awesome Christian movie that's out. It's about the life of Jesus and his disciples. Now, the Bible leaves a lot of interpretation to, to Jesus' life. Was he a carpenter of wood? Was he a carpenter of stone? I've heard many different stories. But in here, in The Chosen, it does put together a story of what his life might have been. Because it doesn't clarify for us. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't cry in movies much, but this movie has actually just brought me to tears. It is just a powerful, anointed movie. You should watch it. You, if you're a Christian, you really should watch it. And so one of the things then, Jabez had that. So I can add fluff to Jabez's life here this morning. Can you imagine him being in the town gates in a meeting? And he suggests something, and they go, oh, Jabez, you're always such a pain. <laughs> Did you ever have a name that you were teased over? My last name, my single last name was Schmidt. Now, you can stop and think about what kind of names can come out of Schmidt. And in grade school, I had a bully boy who liked to torment me over my last name. Needless to say, I didn't put up with his bullying, and I did go tell the teacher who told the principal, and his name is written on a board in that school because he got a spanking for it, and he never harassed me about my last name again. I didn't allow it to define who I was and become intimidated and, um, and scared of going to school every day. And so it is that we have. So it was with Jabez. So it was. We call him pain for the rest of this this series, I'm going to call him pain because he was supposed to be a pain. But Jabez realized that he didn't need to be a pain, that he could live above that. It, the Bible says Jabez was more respected than his brothers. And you wonder why. Was it because they teased him and Jabez didn't rise to it? Because Jabez carried himself with respect in life or with his brothers? that the Bible stops in the middle of this and says, this man was more respected than his brothers. So let's read our scripture. It says, Jabez cried out to God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory, that your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. I mean, God heard him and granted that request. 
So there's going to be four things we're going to look at here that Jabez prayed for. And those four things are going to be blessing from God, enlarge his territory, God's presence, and safety. Now, my hope here is this morning is that when you leave here, you understand what those four things mean in your life. And you have a prayer that you can also pray to God like Jabez did in your life. You know, I believe we all want to pray. We all have the desire to pray. But you sit down and pray and there's silence. Uh, what do I say? God, I'm not sure what I say. Do I say what I want? Do I say I love you? A lot of that comes from we just don't know what to say. We have never learned what to say to God when we speak to God. And we have to be taught. I loved Michael's sermon last week when he taught on the Lord's Prayer. It was a way to pray. And Pastor, who spoke the week before that and, and taught us about the tabernacle prayer, we learned in each one of those sermons how to pray, what to pray when we go before God. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of spitting going on up here. <laughs> You can see it in the lights, and I have a cold, so my nose is plugged to no end. But anyway, I'm hoping that this morning that you will learn how to pray the Jabez prayer and apply it into your life. So the first thing Jabez prays for is, oh, that you would bless me. The Hebrew root for blessing is barak. And what barak means is to stoop down, is to kneel. And what Jabez recognizes here is God is a great God, a man that he is small within God's eyes because God is the God of the universe. He is the mighty God, and he comes before God and says, may I be so bold as to ask you to stoop down, to reach down into my life among all the other lives and bless me. Bless me. Now, the first thing that has to happen in your life is you have to realize that God blessing you is his nature. He, is, he wants to give you blessings. He finds pleasure in blessing your life. And in knowing that, you have to understand, I'm worthy of God blessing me. I am worthy I am not some hidden person that you do not know, see, or hear. And God doesn't see me because the universe is so big and so large. Who am I to God? He wouldn't even hear me. You've got to kill that name, that stereotype you have placed yourself in, in not understanding God loves you. If you were the only one sitting in here, God loves you. God cares for you. He wants to bless and enlarge in your life. You have to also understand that God blesses you so that you can bless others that they see and they, they look at you and say, wow, look what God did for them. God can do that for me. I love the, the story this morning that Pastor was telling the testimony about the, the mother or the the aunt that put her prayer request on the back wall and said, God, that you would find the one that killed my nephew. And it was two weeks. Two weeks later, the police called her and told her, we've arrested him. That's God. She's waited. I don't remember if it was a year and a half or two years, but she's waited. She's waited for that. And she put her prayer request back there, and God answered that prayer. And she gave testimony of that when she came up and told us, look what God did when I put my prayer request back there. And she gave God the glory. Now, one of the things I really enjoy watching when I watch football, I like the guys who make the touchdown, go down there, kneel on one knee, and praise God. Yes. And praise God that God, you did this for me. You helped me be here. You helped me take this touchdown. You helped me do that. Because that's before tens of thousands. A lot of times we have a hard time just praying for our meal in a restaurant, maybe in the witness of 10 people. But they do that. 
And that is what God wants. God wants that when he gives you and blesses you and does what he does for you, he wants you to let others know he can do that for you. He can bless you and take care of you. So you say, I will be a blessing and you will bless others. So the next thing that God shows that Jabez prayed for was to enlarge my territory. Isaiah 54, 2 says, make your tent bigger, stretch it out and make it wider. Don't hold back, make the ropes longer and its stakes stronger because you will spread out to the right and to the left. You have to see beyond your circumstances. Now, um, I have up here a large tent. Anybody who's ever put up a tent or been under a tent, you can see there's four poles. It's a little canopy maybe in your backyard. The canopy's out there. The bigger the tent is, the more poles you need to hold that tent. So when God brings blessing into your life, you have to enlarge in who you are to hold that blessing or you are unable to carry the blessing that God wants you to have. You have to, have to increase your relationship with God that that blessing does not take you down, that that blessing does not cause you to turn your eyes away from the God that gave you what he gave you. One of the things in blessing is the meaning to blessing is not just prosper. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, prosperity church, claim it, name it, um, gain it, whatever. But, and God wants that. He does want to increase us in finances that we can be an, an increased. But there's so many other areas that he wants to increase us in also. But what blessing means is I have the capability to go this far, just this far. That's my capability. I may be able in life to practice. I may be able in life to learn, go to school, and increase who I am a bit. But that's, we all hit our level. But when God blesses us and enlarges our territory, he takes us far beyond what we can take ourselves. He opens doors. He causes circumstances to come in your behalf, to move on your behalf. Just like that lady who did her prayer, God moved on her behalf. He caused a circumstance to happen that was outside of her control. The only person she can give, God, give glory to is God. God moved on her behalf. And so it is with you. But God wants to enlarge in your territory. You've got to be able to take in what God gives you. So in other words, we've got to learn wisdom. There's promises in the Bible that you don't even know, that you can stand on, stand on that promise and claim that before God and say, God, you want to give me this. You want to do this. But if you don't know it, you can't claim it. So we have to enlarge in who we are. We have to look outside of our circumstance and where we're at. Maybe you want a, a job promotion at work. Maybe you want a raise. You'll never have that if you don't ask. You pray before God, God, I need this raise to meet the need to my family. I'm going to step out of who I am, what I see myself as, because you are the God of my life, and I'm going to apply. I'm going to ask for a raise. I'm going to step outside of that. And so it is. You have to see beyond where your circumstances are. You know, we did, the, did our mission statement this morning, winning souls to Christ. How many here would like to win somebody to Christ? How many? would like to win somebody to Christ. Tell yourself. You need to tell yourself every day, God, open the door of opportunity that I will see it and I can win somebody to you, that their life will be changed, that their life can know you. You can do that. And, and I was listening to the, to the 21 days of prayer and the scripture that our, the preacher can't think of his name right offhand. He was doing this. We took it out of his book, and he mentioned in there that um, he was very insecure, very insecure. 
And he said he put his scripture up on his mirror, which I thought was bold of him because either he trusted his wife and she wouldn't say anything to him or, or he just, you know, put it up there and claimed that scripture every day. And the amazing thing is he pastors one of the largest churches in the United States because he didn't allow his circumstance to hold him back. Now, I have to admit, I have always been a very, very shy person. And I hope that from me standing up here, you would never know that about me. I remember praying before God one time and telling God, help me know how to talk to people. I don't even know how to talk to people. I was very shy, very insecure. And I can stop now and look at what God's done in my life and be amazed. It's not me. It's God that's done that. I was standing back this morning at the back back there, and um, Michael was talking to somebody about having to start up the sound system and doing some stuff. And I'm listening to that, and I'm thinking, my goodness, I haven't a clue what he was talking about. If our wonderful volunteers didn't show up, I, don't, I couldn't run this church. I couldn't do it, couldn't get the sound up, couldn't get the lights up, couldn't turn the ACs. I couldn't do a thing because I don't know how. And it leaves me amazed that God speaks to you out there to come to this church to be a part of winning souls to Christ and making them winners in life and causing this church to function. The next thing that God, that he prayed for was, let your hand be with me. And let's see, in Jabez realized the more God blessed him, increased his influence, the more he needed God's presence. Uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ. If it's God's will for you to do, you can do it. Now, you know, we talked about the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and my fast, I realized that I have a lot of games on my phone, and a lot of times when I'm sitting and waiting for Joe, I pull out a game, and I play a game, because what else is there to do? And so, other times, I'm sitting in the doctor's office, I pull out, and I play a game. I'm waiting for Joe to put gas in the truck, I play a game. I'm but what was happening was I must have had 20 games on my phone, and a lot of them are word games, but I know I get points if I come up with words within a certain period of time. I would wake up in the morning and think, man, I need, did I get on that game? I probably should get on that game, and it was the first thing I thought about, and it would happen all throughout the day. And I thought, okay, I really need to get that under control. I mean, it's the first thing. They preached about the first thing we give God when we open our eyes is our thanks and prayer time to God. And I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to give them up. I sh took them all off my phone and said, that's what I'm going to do. Whenever I'm sitting and waiting, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read a devotion. I'm going to do something else that takes the place. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The first couple of days, I was bored. It was like, mmm. And I could tell when throughout the day I would pull my phone out and play a quick game here. And so, I, I mean, I struggled. It was hard, and especially I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this is the doctor's office. I can't really pray here, and the devotion like, is, a, is a verbal devotion. Can't really listen to that. It really wouldn't hurt if I put one on there, and I had to struggle on it, but whoops. What I didn't do was focus on my negative Focus on my desire and the battle that I was fighting to play that game. Instead, I prayed. I stopped and focused on God. God, you're going to help me. I'm going to finish this 21 days. And it was like my husband said, there's, there's games I'll never reload back on. I might reload a word game on. But now I'm never going to go back to being what I was I am going to take that time to pray. God will be first in my mind. But had I failed, let's say I loaded one on there. It's never a failure until you give up. You failed. So what? Pick it up and do it again. And so it is with the New Year's resolution. You'll have a whole year to make that New Year's resolution work. Fail and try again. 
fail and try again. I know a contractor who went bankrupt three times. Three times he went bankrupt in his life. So what if you lost a house in the first rece recession? That doesn't mean you can't get another house. So what if you lost your job? That doesn't mean there's other jobs that are out there. So what? It's only failure when you totally give up and never do it again. And you allow that name, you allow that circumstance to define your life so the rest of your life is a failure. So we can do all things. So he did not want to do anything without God's hand on him. He did not want to go anywhere without God being with him. Scripture behind me says, he said to him, if your presence doesn't go with me, don't carry me up from here. If you're not with me in this plan, if you're not with me in what you want me to do, by golly, I don't want to do it. And I've, I've stood by that all my life. Because how many know there's times when you just think, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done in this relationship. I'm done with this family. I'm done with my parents. I'm done with this work. I'm done with this job. But I have always stopped and prayed, God, is this your will? Because I, for goodness sake, don't want to do anything without it being your will. The final thing that he said was to keep me from harm. Isaiah 41.10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. No matter what we go through, God is with us. God helps us. He protects us. We pray protection over our children. I pray for wisdom with my children because I want to know. I want to be able to pick out, man, if there was something happening to my kids. I wanted to feel that, that I could go to my children and say, hey, I think something's going on. What's going on? And I want to be able to talk and step in with them. Before I went to, I went to um, Joseph's school one time because I had to talk to the principal about, principal about a bully he was encountering. I prayed, God, give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Let your presence be with me and keep us from harm. Keep, keep us from harm. When you step out of here and you drive down the road, you never know what can happen to you. You know, one of the things about being on the motorcycle if I haven't been on the motorcycle for a while, I'm really nervous about it. I mean, I've seen things in my car. I was driving down the 10 one time, and a lug nut came off of a semi, whipped across the freeway, hit that little strip in between my windshield and my side, my side window, hit that, dented it in. And so I know what's out there. I mean, I was in my car. What would be happening if I was in my motorcycle? And I can think these thoughts. And now I don't want to get back on the motorcycle. I could drive down the road and think, how fast are those cars coming? Maybe we ought to drive a little bit over here because this. So it is with life. Things that we encounter in life, we can be afraid. We can be worried. But God gives us the promise that he is going to keep us from harm. The devil prowls about around like a roaring lion looking for someone to destroy. 1 Peter 5, 8. Sometimes it's not circumstances in your life that's causing the problems that you have. Sometimes that person at work or that neighbor or whatever is not circumstances. Sometimes it is a spiritual battle against who you are and what Satan wants to rob or steal from you. And we need to pray that God keeps us in safety in our spiritual life, that Satan has no power to come against us and steal what God gives us. Amen? So this is a prayer I would pray, saying Jabez's prayer. I have put it down into our language. And I pray, please do good things for me. Come down and bless my life so that I can be a blessing to those who are less fortunate or do not know the love your salvation gives. Let your presence be on me daily. Make my life an influence. Grow so that others can see how you take care of your people and they can experience it also. Perfect. Protect me from emotional 
physical and spiritual harm so it will not have a negative effect in my life. I hit every single one of those in my own words as to what I want God to do, as to how I want God to be with me and the relationship that I want with God. And I can't tell you how many times God's answered that. Joe and I have talked and stood in a maze. I, we bought our first house with 100 bucks in our pocket. We wanted to rent the house. Joe found the man that owned the house and called him up and asked him if we could rent it. And the man says, well, why can't you buy it? Joe says, I've got 100 bucks in my pocket, my checking account. I can't buy that house. And the guy says, I'll personally carry the loan for you. I'll personally take that $100 as a down payment, and you can own this house. We owned that house, and we sold it for a $10,000 profit. And so it went on. I now have owned two houses that have been a dream house. A house I put up as a picture in my closet and said, God, one day you're going to give me that because you love me and desire to bless me and you want me to tell others what he can do for you. I can stand up here and tell you that God can bless you if you will, if you will love him, serve him, and pray and ask. Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed in here. I've given you two instances. A man named Sue who spent his whole life fighting. And in total retaliation to a name that was given him. Or a man named Jabez who was given a bad name. But didn't spend his whole life in a negative manner. You are no different than either one of these. You can be the man named Sue. Or you could be the man named Jabez. It's up to you. And this morning it all begins by you giving your life to Christ. By you knowing God is your personal Savior. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you do not know Christ as your Savior and you want to, raise your hand before him. I see that hand signifying. I see that hand. That, God, I want my life to be different from this point on. I want to know you as my Savior. I see that hand. I want you to be the king of my life. I see those hands. You can put them down. Church, we're going to lead these, these wonderful souls in a prayer. If you're online right now and you're watching us, you can do the same thing. You could bow your head, close your eyes, and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life that you can be changed and never be the same person that you were. So, church, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to receive you as my Savior. I pray you will forgive me of my sins. Open my heart. Open my ears. And open my eyes to you and your truth. I command the chains on my life that Satan has placed there to come off and be replaced by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you would keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. I always give the opportunity for anybody in the service to take a moment to talk to Jesus. Maybe you have a label on your life. Maybe you are allowing yourself to carry a label that you've put on there or that somebody else has put on there. And right now, all you need to do is talk to God and say, I don't want this label anymore. God, take me beyond what I see myself as or what others see me as. Take me beyond into what you see me as. If you're here, I want you to raise your hand. If God has spoken to you, I see hands. Yes, I see hands. Let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to me. Help me to walk beyond what I am and see your full glory in my life. I will praise you, give you honor and glory by living my life for you. 
and stepping outside of my victim box. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.